Well, gentlemen, I got to tell you, I'm very, very excited. This is uh, one of not only one of my clo closest friends in the world, but one of my favorite people in the world. Um, I've known her uh, since 2009. We went to grad school together, went to seminary together, actually. Uh, she is the senior pastor of the Church of the Resurrection in Harlem, New York. Um, she is also my co-laborer in the gospel, um, a mother, um, a, a pastor, a educator, the head of the Booker T. Washington, uh, Washington Learning Center in East Harlem, New York. Uh, 325 101st Street um, in Harlem, New York. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the Let's Chop It Up family, my friend, the pastor, Kimberly Wright. Well, hey, what's, what's going on? What's going on, sister? How you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad to be with you all. No, I'm glad to have you. you. Guys, have you haven't seen you in a long time. I, I know, time. I know, too long. We gotta figure that out. That's because COVID happened. COVID. COVID. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. If, I don't know if the pastor remembers me. Uh, I was behind the camera last time I saw. Uh, yes, I do. I absolutely <laughs> do. Yes. So, uh, pastor, pastor, I'm gonna start with the first question. Since you said about COVID, how did COVID affect the community that you serve, and how did it affect the young people, and what have you been doing from 2020 to, to help out the community and and what are some of the things that you have seen? Oh, Lord. I mean, <laughs> this could be a whole show by itself. Um, so I will tell you um, that as soon as COVID happened, we had to shut down um, our after-school program, our preschool program. We were getting ready for summer camp, which did not happen last year. And um, right away, um, I, I think that we are just a church that's very um, rooted in our community. And so, you know, it's kind of like, here's a crisis. The first thing is like, let's make sure everyone is safe. I'm not one of the pastors who is like, you know, the blood of Jesus, we're going to keep coming to church and God is going to take care of us. I was like, okay, everybody go home. The Lord warned us, right? The, the, yeah. the writing is on the wall. Everybody go home and be safe and let's figure this all out. And then, you know, and then we started getting the body count. And um, for me, it's it's personally very high, right? So um, so I'm, I'm very grateful we have lost no one in our church to COVID, thank God. Um, but right away, we, we knew what we were supposed to be doing. We saw that people were dying and we started what we call a Let's Live campaign. So I was very concerned about all the teenagers who are out in the street, not wearing masks. You know, I know like, you know, it's it's not fashionable. It doesn't look cool. You look vulnerable, um, you know, because you look like you're trying to protect yourself and you're not supposed to try to protect yourself from nothing but maybe a bullet. Maybe you ain't even supposed to do that. I don't know. But um, I just saw a lot of young men hanging out way too much. And I know, you know, our kids go home to parents and grandparents. We live in close proximity to one another here. And two thirds of people who have died from COVID have died or, or who have been infected have been infected by family members, by people they live with. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, being concerned for not only our young people, but the people they live with who are very vulnerable. We, we, we gave out masks, we gave, you know, water, food, like, you know, we, gave out other stuff to make getting a mask a conversation and then to talk about safety. Um, and then we reopened, we opened our preschool back up and now we have a remote learning lab. So our kids, we know our kids are home suffering. This is the worst thing that could have ever happened to our children. And let me just say that our children and our seniors, they are the superheroes. They are the warriors of COVID. Like what is how our kids are being decimated right now. We are losing our children, their mental health, their emotional well-being, their spiritual well, spiritual well-being physically. They're not playing. They're not outside. They're not active. Um, they are depressed. They are anxious. They're worried for themselves, for their parents. They're grieving. They miss school. They miss their activities. My daughter was supposed to graduate in May. No graduation from her for her from college. My son was due to be a lead in a play at school, and he had a birthday May, March 29th. All of that, his 16th birthday, all of that was missed. And so, you know, all of our children have a story about what's missing, what's not happening. Um, and then, um, you know, so we know our kids needed to get out of their houses. All of our parents are not equipped 
to take care of their children. Some houses have multiple children. Some parents are going to work and can't stay home, right? It's like everyone has a different scenario and we wanted to respond the best way we could in the way that, that we're able to. And so we open back up. We have a remote learning lab for, for kids and we, we have our preschool open. We will be open this summer. We have found the research says that children are safer than they are at home. Um, and so we're, we're doing that. I've buried a lot of people um, because of COVID. So it has personally really affected me. Um, but, you know, I know I have to keep going. So yeah. that's what we're doing. We're going, we're in the middle of a war and we're trying yeah. to, I don't know if we can win at this point, 500,000 people, right? So we've already lost, but we're trying to save as many as we can. Mm -hmm. Pastor Kim, I, I, you know, I, I'm always fascinated by your story, and um, many people don't know you have five degrees. Uh, you are a product of East Harlem. Um, what has made you commit to the neighborhood? You are, you are as dedicated as anybody I've ever met in my life, as far as, especially as far as ministry is concerned. The, the passion that you have for the kids is is unparalleled. What made you stay there, and and, and what drives you? So I want to say it's a couple of things. One is that I grew up in East Harlem. In East Harlem, District 4 had an excellent school system. I was well educated in East Harlem. I was well prepared um, for the scholarship that I got to go to a New England boarding school for high school. And um, I got there and had absolute culture shock and wanted to come home where I was loved and nurtured and educated and well taken care of. Oh, oh man! Yeah, All right, Jamie will get her back. He'll get her back. Like, yeah, thanks, yeah. Bill. Lost her. You know, you know what? You know what the best. So, like, give give a little people some things about the past. Well, we I'll, I'll tell you. You know, so she has, has started a a school. Um, her her former pastor, Reverend uh, Leroy Rixey, um, her predecessor started. He had this vision for this this ministry in Harlem and, and the thing that I would uh that I love about her and and you all would appreciate this is um she you're not gonna see her flying around in a Lear jet. You're not gonna see her in a Bentley or whatever. She's a person that genuinely is for the people. And um as she rejoins us she could tell her own story but I could just tell you a first uh hand account that she definitely served. She's a true a disciple of Christ and a champion for people, but uh, you can take it back, Pastor Kim. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I went away to boarding school, and what I found out was that you know there are schools that educate their children in a way that's very different than the way we educate ours. Um, those schools um, are built to create the leaders of this world, not just this country, but of the world. Um, they are taught differently. They're taught to think differently, and the expectation of those children very, very different. Those children who are dynastically wealthy. Um, you know, I, I guess a lot of us would call them trust fund babies. Those kids are in school right now. They're, they're, those children are in school every day right now and going to music classes and art classes and dance classes and whatever other classes and they're vacationing. Life has not stopped. They put a mask on and they have kept it moving while we have been paralyzed. So anyway, I went to boarding school and then I came back my senior year because I hated it. I hated feeling like a visitor and an unwanted guest in a culture where I knew, like in a system that I knew was not created for me. And so I came back to New York. I graduated um, from Manhattan Center for Math and Science, the first graduating class. Um, and I graduated with brilliant young people of color. Our whole class went to four-year colleges. I think one of our one student, some of them Ivy League schools. I think one student went into the uh, into the uh, armed armed services. Um, so I was. I, I will also say the other side of my story is that while I was, uh, I always did well in school. I was a menace to society. So I was <laughs> addicted to drugs. I sold drugs. I ran the streets. I was promiscuous. I, you know, I mean, I was a problem child in every way of the world word. I was a problem in this community. And so I owe this community a lot. It was nothing but good to me. And I wreaked havoc here. Um, I will also say though, I love it here. I love, I love my community and I love my people. I love 
black and latino people so this is home and it's crazy because when i when people know that i've gone away to college i went to prep school i you know i i can make a choice and be somewhere else and so you know people within the community are always like why you come back here why you want to be here I'm like do you understand what you're saying about yourself yeah. You, you are, mm-hmm. like, why would you ask me that question? Where else would mm-hmm. I rather be? Mm-hmm. Where else do I want to live? Who else do I want to work with and for? Who else mm-hmm. would I rather serve? My biggest nightmare would be having to get on a train in the morning and go into some office building downtown and punch a clock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Like, what, what made you choose the name Booker T. Washington? Of all of all the people you could have chosen, what made you go with that name? Well, I didn't choose it. My um, the Booker T. Washington Learning Center was started a year before I got here by my former pastor. So okay. um, he chose it, and then he introduced me to Booker T. And then I also learned about George Washington Carver, who worked with Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee University, um, which was not Tuskegee University when they worked there. It was a normal and industrial school. But um, I learned this amazing philosophy. Um, And I also was just so inspired by like the strength, the wisdom, the brilliance, and the dedication of Booker T to his people. And his literally, if you read up from slavery, literally his willingness to make something out of nothing. Like when he he finished at Hampton. They called him to go to Tuskegee, and it was the town of Tuskegee, not the school. There was nothing there. He made the bricks with his hands. He, The students figured out how to make the bricks. And if you've ever been to Tuskegee, you would imagine, when I read, when I was reading about it, you would imagine, like, what, so, like, what could the buildings look like? Little square things with little bricks. Like, how good could this be architecturally? How... Right, if you go there and you see the buildings, I think it was 21 buildings or something was made by the students. And you see what is built there. It is majestic. It is excellent. It is beautiful. It is nothing short of miraculous. Um, And so it was, you know, a man who came out of slavery. So who had everything working against him in many ways, I feel as a black woman, that's my life and growing up poor. and being trauma, all the trauma I've had in my life. So, you know, he came out of slavery and determined that economic freedom was the way to go. And the only way he thought economic freedom would happen for his people is if he built an institution, which is, you know, we have to be institution building builders. Um, he built an institution that would serve to make other people institution builders, right? So, and would allow them to be economically free from um, dependency on white people, white money, white systems, and and all of that. So um, I know he, you know, I mean, I I don't have to keep defending him, but, you know, he gets a bad rap. He really does. He does, but I I ain't going to think on, yeah, I ain't going to go on that, but, you know, he does get a little bad rap. (laughs) (laughs) we would would understand the historical context and we would understand um where he was in this country he was in the south not the north he had been a slave he wasn't Mm -hmm. born free Mm -hmm. he went to hampton he didn't go to harvard right completely different agenda and we don't have to pit one against the other but um he had nothing but the right intentions for his people. And when we look at how the people he served and developed and groomed were doing, right, during the period of reconstruction, they're doing better, arguably, than we are doing right now. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I want to ask I want to ask you a question, Reverend. Right. Um, I was just having a conversation earlier today with my wife, and she brought to my attention, like, um, this article that she was reading about this young lady that during the pandemic, she was starving. Like she couldn't get anything to eat. She's going to school. She's remote learning. And, you know, food is something we take for granted on a daily basis. You know what I mean? But are you noticing in, in, in the area that you basically help, are you noticing kids being hungry on a daily basis? Yes. So one of the things I noticed, cause I'm a mama who shops at the local grocery store is that the mm. price of food, is through the roof. 
Correct. It's going up a lot. Like it's, like it's crazy. I'm like, aren't we in a pandemic? Shouldn't we be trying to keep the prices down? Even as yeah. store owners, like just being sensitive to your community, right? Like uh, even if what you've had to buy has gone up, like at some point, like you can't, whatever. Anyway, yes. So the price of food has gone up. Many more people are unemployed. Mm -hmm. um, I think food is, is scarce for many people. I, we don't live in a food desert by any means, right? There's food and vegetable in every corner in New York City, thank God. We have to yeah. make better choices about the way that we eat. But the good, you know, there's a decent diet awaits us. Um, but yeah, our, our children are hungry. And um, they're also malnourished, many of them. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that they need to eat, it's they also need to eat better than they're eating. One of the things that, you know, should have been uh, a result of this pandemic when when we kept hearing people say um, that people were dying from um, underlying issues, right, mm -hmm. pre-existing conditions. Those are conditions that people would say the black community kind of has the corner on. They are all preventable illnesses. And so while we were hearing the sirens and doing the death count every day, we also should have been talking about, and we, we need to do it. We need to talk about diet and exercise and changing the way that we eat and drink and sleep and ex you know all of it and take care of ourselves. And mm -hmm. we have to start that with our children. Yeah. We must start doing that with our kids. Fixing it in an adult is next to impossible. Let me ask you this we question. We have like, to start feeding our children better. Yeah, I know before when we met before that um, I asked you a question. Like you only, for your place, you only take you don't take any city money. Can you tell people why you don't take any city 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 funding? Because people, a lot of people don't understand like how how nonprofits work. Sometimes we get it's called government contracts and stuff like that that we right. you know. And then we get private funding. Why? Why? What's the reason? Can you tell me why you don't take the city funding? Well, one is philosophical and the other one is just practical. So philosophically, I feel like I want to take care of my own people. I want to be able to say what they need, how they get it, who they get it from, right? Like, um, I I believe that um, interdependence. I mean, some of this is also like religious conviction, right? Like. I don't want to be dependent on the government. I do believe that people are supposed to be interdependent. We are supposed to take care of one another. Um, and so I want the freedom to do it my way. Mm -hmm. I want the, I want the, um, I, I want my program to have the kind of integrity where we're able to say, and this is not a slight on anybody else who takes government money. This is just a personal decision, but I want us to be able to say, that we took care of our own kids. Um, and if that means that we have a little less and I have to work a little harder and I have, you know, this so be it. But I, I really appreciate the fact that we have been taking care of our own children for over 30 years now. Um, and then just in a practical sense, um, it's a lot of paperwork. It is, you know, you need a whole person or people or department to, to do contract management work. And um, I'm good at, at, at uh, raising private money. I have really no interest in doing the work of public money. I can't blame you because I got a lot of government contracts and they drive me crazy. I can't you know, listen. Like, oh, listen, listen no. before government contracts, before government contracts, I had head. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they don't look I man. The little bit I have. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, Pastor Ken Rod asked an interesting question about um about children that are hungry. Um, expound a little bit about our father's kitchen. Let the people know what that is, what that program is during regular times outside of a pandemic. Okay, so um, you know, growing up um, poor and and being people of color and and like this community is black and Latino, so. Food is, is everything. It is the center of everything that we do. And it is a big part of our identity. And it's part of how we comfort and come together, um, how we comfort each other, how we come together, how we celebrate everything. So um, I wanted us to have, because the community was being gentrified, um, I wanted us to have a community dinner. I wanted it to be that 
Um, when I thought about the poor people in our community, I wanted it to be that big families that couldn't go out to eat, couldn't take three kids or four kids out to dinner, could, could bring their kids here, sit at a table that had fresh flowers and tablecloth and, and a waiter or waitress come and serve them a three course meal that was nutritious and delicious, um, <laughs> not far from home in a church, in our sanctuary where the pastors, where the pastors come by and say hello and offer prayer if you need. But mostly I just wanted them to feel like they had a place they could come and relax and, and have time with their family. And then I wanted people who were moving into the community to have a space where they could meet the people who've been here. I also wanted them to see who we are. I wanted a, a, an open door time where they were not just coming in on Sunday morning gawking. Um, or if they would even come in, right? So I, I, I wanted a time where new members of our community could come in and see what we were doing. Um, and then finally, you know, I come from a family that where hospitality is very, very important. We had restaurants. I just felt like it was a way to use one of my skills and, you know, my knowledge. And I don't know, God just said, do it bring them together. And so that's what we do. The first Wednesday of every month until the pandemic mm. happened, we would bring in about 70 to 100 people. They would be fed. Every table has a waiter, somebody around who can pray with them. Um, it was never like, you know, you have to come to church or people are not going to come here. And, you know, it's not a bait and switch. It was dinner. We invited you to dinner and it was dinner. And we just went out in the community, 300 invitations and handed out 300 invitations and about 100 people would come. So one out of three, that's an amazing, um, that says a lot about uh, the people who are here doing outreach and how, um, and the reputation of our church, the trust that people in our community have for what we do and the quality of, of you know, our food and our care and our service. So what, what do you, so what do you, what do you see, like one of the, what do you see a school being at, after, since this pandemic and thing, like maybe five years from now, what do you see? What do you see the future of and, and of East New York? Because like you just mentioned, gentrification is happening. I mean, East New York, I'm sorry, East Harlem. Gentrification is happening. What do you see in Harlem? Do you see our faces still being in that community five years from now? Um, I'm not, I, I mean, so this particular community has so much public housing in it. We have the most public pro, like pro, housing projects per square foot or something like that. And in whatever radius, it's some high number of New York City. I can't repeat it exactly, but um, for a square foot, we have the most housing projects. And so those are not gonna get torn down in the next five years. Poor people are going to be here. What they did was they built in every empty lot and in every tenement that they could tear down and remodel and you know gut, they've done that. Um, and so we're gonna all have to figure out how to coexist. And I don't know, you know, I, I'm struggling. I think I think a lot of people are struggling. On one hand, it's like you're you know you're here and you're our neighbor, so you're welcome. Um, on another hand, the way people come is is a little bit problematic. They come and there's like the, the building across the street from our church. It has a a shuttle bus that takes them to 96th Street because you know God forbid you have to walk to the subway at 103rd Street. Um, right. You know, just things like that. Like you, you don't shop here. Your kids don't go to school here. You don't come to church here, but you take advantage of lower rents, you know? Mm. Um, so, so those kinds of things, I pray that in time, um, if people are going to be here, that we are more of a community. Um, I pray that more people are not dislo uh, dislocated and um, feeling like they, they, they have to leave, um, priced out of everything. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned. Um, sometimes, you know, you let things collapse to a point where everybody just kind of abandons it and then other people come in. And mm -hmm. I feel like with our school system, a lot of times I feel like that's what's happening. Um, if they can't take our housing, then they will just destroy the school system and then we will have to flee for that reason um, or the violence or the something, right? But there's, it's it's hard to be here. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned earlier, uh, Pastor, that um, the more affluent schools 
were still sending their children to school. You know, they still the children were still attending classes. Um, and that's not the case there. What is happening with um with socialization? You know, there's a certain socialization that goes to school. What are you seeing with regard to our children there, um, with regard to the lack of socialization that comes from them not being able to attend school and see their friends or go to their activities if they have any, or I don't, you know, I don't know what there is. Well, I think for some of them, there, um, there's too much of whatever negative stuff might be going on at home, right? There's just more of that. So if you're, whatever your problems are at home, whether there may be violence or um, mental illness or anxiety, you know, like, or drug addiction or whatever, or overcrowding, um, you know, there's more of that. And then you're living in close quarters with people 24 hours a day. And, you know, there's what that brings. Um, and then, you know, as young people, you're physical and you, right now our kids are sitting, we have like, you know, right before this happened, what would we say? We would say preschoolers or little kids 30 minutes a week on, on, on screen time. Um, older kids, 30 minutes a day, no more, right? And then all of a sudden this happens and suddenly it's fine and we're ignoring what the repercussions of this are, right? Before we, we had a long list of all the ways that screen time hurt children just 10 months ago. And all of a sudden, this is just the way we have to do it. There's another way to do it. You know, certain people know how to educate children. They happen to be in charge of our educational system. Their children don't go to our schools though. So they, you know, there's one standard for one set of children, and then there's a whole different standard for ours. So our kids need what all children need. They need exercise. They need sunlight. They need interaction. They need positive reinforcement every day. They need the arts. They need science. They need labs. They need, you know, like the resources that are in school. Um, and they need friendship. Play is a child's work, right? That is their job. Their job is to play they were created that way and so the fact that they are homebound is you know the the repercussions depending on how well the parents or guardians or whatever are able to manage that it's it's difficult i have a 16 year old at home this has not been good for him for his mental health and i talk to other young people and then try to manage it like when do we let you know do i let you see your friends do they have to test before they come to our house do i let you have a sleepover do we we go on vacation so let one of your friends test and come with us like how do i keep you safe keep the rest of us safe but allow you to have some sense of normalcy in your life you know, he told me the other day, I want to go back to like, I want guitar classes. I don't want them online. I want karate class. I don't want to do a karate class online. I, you know, like he's sick of this already. Mm -hmm. How is he supposed to go through the normal things of being 16 and 17, all those little milestones, stones, good and bad stuff that he should yeah. be doing right now? He's not doing any of it mm -hmm. that I know of. Oh. Well, Pat, that's the case. So, First of you all, know, our kids are in a terrible position. Thank, thank you so much for for joining us and sharing that tonight. Before we go, I just want you to tell the people um, where the church is located and how they can find you online, your social media, and how they can uh, watch services on Sunday until we open up. And can they make it rain at the church? Nope. Give me a donation. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> we, made, we made it. all oh, we almost got through. Oh, we almost got through. We, 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 we just got through. Yeah. Yeah. We just got through. I said, I said, well behaved tonight. I was thinking too. We sound so, we sound so intelligent right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. 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 First of all, Pastor Kim, this is my opportunity to say we will never get anywhere. <laughs> we will never get anywhere as a people. I have to say that, but but go ahead, tell the people how we can how we can find you. Know how to ballet and boogaloo. It's fine. That'll make us any less thank intelligent. You, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so we are the Church of the Resurrection. We're at 325 East 101st Street. 325 East 101st Street. And that is in New York City, 10029, if you want to send something in the mail. Um, or if you want to stop by. Uh, Resurrection Sunday, we are opening, opening, opening. We are reopening. Um, 11 o'clock Sunday mornings. Um, with all safety protocols in place. Um, 
We are on Facebook, the Booker T. Washington Learning Center, the Booker T. Washington Learning Center on Facebook. We're also the Church of the Resurrection NYC, Resurrection NYC on Facebook. And you'll see, you know, you'll know it's us. You'll see plenty of pictures of me and other people. Um, so, it, I mean, it'd be great to have interaction, to have people follow us and see what we're doing. We are also the BTW Preschool on Instagram. Um, our little ones are on Instagram. It's easier for their parents to follow with photos. So BTW Preschool um, on Instagram. So please follow us, support, show you love. And you guys, let me just say, I have been listening to y'all. This is wonderful. <laughs> Oh, thank, oh you. thank you, thank you. Thank I thought you were going to get us. So good. I thought you, I thought you were going to say something bad. Yeah, I thought she was going to get us. That's what I thought you were going to do. Like, I heard some of the stuff y'all be saying. Oh, let me tell you. No, no, I hear what I have heard it, and I love it. I love it. Okay, it's exactly what we need. We need to hear black men's voices. We don't. We're not allowed in the barbershop all the time. I walk into a barbershop, it gets quiet. I got to stand <laughs> around for like twenty minutes before they, you know. Take it up again. <laughs> yeah. So it's wonderful to hear y'all chop it up. Uh, really thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Voices, the way you think. Not enough of us are listening to y'all. So thank you so much for creating this platform. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. Love you. Let's have a great day. All right. Love you. Love y'all.